Hey, what's up, brothers and sisters? Today, we are going to talk about some modern web tooling stuff. In particular, we're going to talk about task runners. And this is a screencast I've been wanting to do for a while because not enough people take advantage, particularly in government, of the type of modern web development tooling we have available to us. And that's really unfortunate. These tools let us, uh, our workflow is faster, it's less error prone, our final product is better, things are more consistent. Um, it's really just, I can't imagine going back to a time where I wasn't using something like a task runner and a lot of people haven't gotten there yet and I really want them to get there. So we're going to take a look at how to lay out a project and there's no right way to do that. We'll just take a look at one of mine and then using a task runner to do all your fun stuff. Uh, CSS pre-processing and auto prefixing and minifying. We're gonna look at JavaScript concatenation and uglification. We're gonna look at image uh, optimization. We're going to look at cache busting and, and live reloads so you don't have to do the control tab F5 dance. All this stuff and some of it will be technical, some of it will be uh, not too bad, but I think no matter what your, your current uh, proficiency is, you should get something that will help you in some way if you're building websites. So first let's take, we're going to take a look at how a typical project might be laid out, and then we'll talk about the task runner we're gonna use here called Gulp. Now, this is my quality of life dashboard, the dev branch. Uh, and most projects you see will have at least two folders going. One is for your source files. And here I call those my assets. Um, and that is the stuff that is going to get crunched over to production. So it'll be all your individual JavaScript files. It'll be your your less or SAS or stylus files, it'll be your raw images, it'll be all that stuff that needs to get over into production. Public, or you'll sometimes see it called build, it'll be the stuff that comes out of the back end of your process to go from assets to production. That'll have like your HTML, your production ready images, your concatenated and minified CSS and JavaScript, those types of things. So at a very minimum, that's what you'll see. You'll you, a lot of times see a lot of other stuff, docs and tests and this and that and the other. Those are the two main things you need. In assets, I lay it out as images, uh, build and source, uh, less uh, JavaScript, and then subdivide it there as I need to just for organization, not for any scientific reason. This is all just personal preference. And in public, you'll see index.html, any other HTML files, and your final, this is our uh, uh, concatenated and minified, or not concatenated, uh, pre-processed and minified CSS. And our pre-processed, uh, not pre-processed, our concatenated and uglified JavaScript. And all this stuff, this is the, kind of this folder is what you would dump over on, say, your production web server. So that's a basic project layout. Uh, you can lay out your project any way you want and you should. Don't listen to anyone tells you, that tells you they have the perfect project layout, they don't. Make something that makes the most sense for your project and your workflow. But at a minimum, you should have separate locations for your basic assets you edit your code on and your final product, because your final product's going to be minimized and uglified and you don't want to work on anything there. That's project layout. Now let's talk about task running. Uh, all the stuff you need to do, task runner is what it sounds like. You need to minify your CSS, that's a task. You need to concatenate your JavaScript, that's a task. These are tasks you have to do all the time as you develop. Every time you make a change to your, your CSS or your less or your SAS or your stylus, and hit save, you want a, pro a watch process to detect that and then pre-process and do all that stuff it needs to do. That's stuff you have to do all the time. It's not something you want to do by hand. 
there are lots of task runners out there. Uh, there are a couple GUI ones I've never used. If you're a Ruby person, you've probably heard of or used Guard. Uh, it's a task runner. I like Guard. The best thing about Guard is it's very easy to set up and configure. Things I don't like about it are it's a little on the slow side and it's a uh, if you have a complex workflow you want to put into it, it can be kind of tricky to do that in, in Guard, at least from my experience. I'm kind of an idiot. You might have better experience there than I do. Grunt is probably the most popular right now. Grunt runs under Node, so it's in written in JavaScript, and uh, it's really powerful. And I've been, I have and still use that uh, quite a bit. The new one on the scene, which we're going to be using here, and I just started using a couple weeks ago, is called Gulp. And it also runs under Node. It's JavaScript based. It uh, has a couple of advantages, at least for my workflow, over Grunt. Uh, one is it's faster. And the more complicated your workflow, the faster it usually is. With Grunt, it's very hard to get from A to B sometimes without a lot of intermediate intermediary rights to disk. Like if we want to uh, pre-process -pro pre our less, uh, that's a step output file, hit to disk. If we want to then run auto prefix around that, that's a hit to disk output file. Then if we want to minify that, another hit to disk output file. And all of that slows it down. With Gulp uses node streams or, or pipes to essentially just flow all that through memory and then dump it out at the end. And that makes it quite a bit faster. I also like it because I find it easier to configure. Uh, Grunt can be hard to set up and get running just right. Gulp is quite a bit easier, at least, at least from my experience. It's much more like plain old writing JavaScript. So that's what Gulp is, and that's what we're going to be using. Now, the first thing you'll need to do if you haven't done it yet is install Node. Uh, if you're on Linux, it'll be in your package manager, install uh, Node.js and NPM if it's a separate package. On Ubuntu it is. Uh, if you're on Windows, download run the installer. If you're on Mac, uh, you probably just, you know, say Siri install some shit or something. But you'll get it installed. It'll be not too hard. Node comes with a package manager. A package manager is a piece of software that manages, uh, it installs, it uh, keeps up to date, and it can remove packages on your system, software packages. So for Node, all the things you install, like a task runner, like Grunt or, or uh, Gulp, you install it through NPM. So that's what we're going to use. Once you have Node installed, you can just uh, say, uh, do npm install and you want to make this global so you go dash g and you just type gulp and it'll run off and go fetch that and install it I already have it installed but uh, oh I need to be root for this don't I so it's already I'll just install it again it's gonna run off and NPM, like a package manager should, manages all your dependencies. So Gulp might depend on a whole bunch of other packages, and it's going to go fetch those and install those too. So now I have Gulp installed globally. We're in our project directory right now. Um, so we have our uh, assets in public folder. Now the modules we're going to be using for Gulp includes Gulp installed locally and uh, I'm going to put this in the show notes so you don't have to type all this out. We're going to install a module for less, for uh, minifying CSS, for auto prefixer, for uglify, for uh, image min, concatenating, uh, replacing, which is basically like a text, a regular expression, search and replace, and live reload for a live re reload environment. So I will put this uh, big long command in the uh, show notes. But in your project folder, where you're going to be running Gulp, which would be probably be in the root folder, you're going to put in this big long command with all these modules, hit enter. 
and it's going to run and go get all that stuff and install it for you along with all of the uh, all the dependencies and you'll be good to go you are good to gulp away ah and it npm is quite loud and we're going to assume all that was quite good so now we have all our dependencies to start on our task runner we need to make a gulp file and it's just going to be called gulpfile.js which is a default file name and let's pull up some sublime text uh, magic here one of these now we have an empty file now I'm just going to make you watch me type in the first part because I think that as I talk through it as I type that helps drill kind of into your head what we're doing we're just first going to load our various uh, gulp modules so we'll go var gulp equals require or gulp and we're let's start out with say our CSS processing I'm using less here you could use sass or stylus as well or instead rather uh, we'll go less equals require uh, gulp dash less and we're going to want to run auto prefix around that stuff so we'll go auto prefixer will require well dash auto prefixer and we're going to want to minify that CSS too so we'll go minify CSS equals require uh, go Unify CSS. So now we're loading all of our required modules. Let's make a gulp task. And we're going to call it styles. And we'll make a function. And here's where we'll do our gulp pipe workflow. So we're going to go. First, we'll name our source gulp.src and our main less file, which pulls in all the other less files. See, it does all our imports here, um, is main.less. So we're going to go in that gulp file. We're going to put uh, assets less main.less. We're going to go, we're going to pipe that over to, we're going to pipe that over to less first. We'll go, we're going to return this. We'll go pipe, we'll go less. So we're taking our less file that we just loaded uh, and we're going to pipe it over to less so it can pre process. Then we're going to pipe that to. auto prefixer and auto prefixer can take a whole bunch of arguments auto prefixer if you haven't used it before is really awesome what it does is it looks through your CSS file and it looks through the web browsers you want to support and it adds or removes vendor prefixes if it needs them like if you're doing box shadow and say you want to support the last three versions of browsers and one of those you need a dash moz for your box shadow it'll stick that in there for you so you can basically completely ignore vendor prefixes uh, while you're writing your lesser sass and support just the browsers you need so it'll do neat stuff like if you're only supporting ie9 or higher and you're including bootstrap it'll go through bootstrap and take out all the stuff you don't need for browsers that are older than that. So auto prefixer is really great. Let's just have it do something simple. We'll have it get the last two versions of browsers and we'll also have it specifically get IE9. Well, auto prefix, and there's all kinds of arguments. You can tell it to get particular versions of iOS and Android and good stuff. Auto prefixer, and then we're gonna wanna minify that CSS and then we're going to want to output that to our destination so we'll go dot dest 
we'll go public and we're going to want CSS and because the less is named main.less it's automatically going to name it main.css so let's save that uh, bu, bu, bu. Hmm. oh uh, you should also always have linter running I was missing a comma there I wonder what I was complaining about so let's see how badly I type now we have a task called styles that's going to take our less file and pre-process it and uh, auto prefix it and minify it and send it to its destination. Wait for the error message. Let's see, we'll go gulp and we're going to give it styles. And there it did in 817 milliseconds. It ran that task for us. It uh, it pre-processed, it auto prefixed, and it minified and it output it to its destination. So we've just got our whole. CSS processing workflow done in Gulp as a task. Isn't that cool? Now, what else do you need to do? You need to do all your JavaScripty stuff, you need to do all your image stuff, and you need to do some watch tasks. Now, I'm going to copy some of this in so you don't have to watch me type and type and type. We're going to add a bunch more, uh, all the modules we added. Uh, this tiny LR isn't a Galt specific module, but it's our live reload server. We got our styles all set up. Let me just pull in, say, our scripts. Now here's for our JavaScript pre-processing. And one thing you can do with any of these is very useful for JavaScript is you may have a certain order you need JavaScript files to be concatenated uh, lest you get lots of error messages. So you can just make an array of all your JavaScript files you need in the order you need them. Now if there's a folder like this viz folder where I don't need it in a particular order, this is even better for you, you can just put star.js and it'll grab everything in there. You see here I'm getting only particular bootstrap uh, uh, includes not all of them and some leaflet stuff and all, all the fun stuff I need for this project. Now we got a gulp task called scripts which is going to concatenate and then and then push it out. Let me show you and also have it doing the live reload stuff which we don't really need yet. But I'm gonna have it do something else too. We're gonna uglify it here. I think that's all I need. We're coming out this live reload server and see if that'll work. I go gulp scripts. Now it's running and what I generally do is break uh, uglification into a separate thing for final build. I'll concatenate but I won't uglify because uglify takes some time. So for this scripts, we're going to take uglify out. So now when we're just doing development, see it'll run extremely quick, 31 milliseconds. So now we've got scripts running. Uh, I want to do some image minification. And here's image min and here I'm giving it a whole folder worth of images and I'm giving it a destination I'm giving it a folder in our assets and I'm giving it a destination in our public folder and I'm giving it some optimization type uh, things it can try to do it's probably not going to get us a whole lot because this project I think I, I uh, have some pretty good base files to work with well, let's save that and we'll run gulp image min. And off it goes. It's minimizing all that stuff. It says most of it's already optimized, but it's saving bits and bytes and kilobytes here and there. You'll be surprised. If you've got one of those sites with a bunch of big pictures and images on it, you can save a ton of space. 
you need to run that through some type of image optimization for the web process. So we got image min. Let me show you another one that is uh, kind of handy. We're going to do a replace. And this is for cache busting. On most websites, you tell the browser to cache JavaScript and CSS for a while out in the future and don't cache HTML. What can happen there, uh, I know I've talked about this a lot before, but what can happen there is you change your HTML and your CSS and your JavaScript and you put it out there. And your HTML is different for the browser, but it hits the cache for the CSS and JavaScript and your stuff is all jank. So, what you can do when you're loading your CSS and JavaScript is give it a fake argument like this. We're just saying uh, foo equals and then just a random thing, just a random number. So if that number changes when they load their HTML, this and that number changes from the last time they load your HTML, it sees that as a different uh, URI and it's going to pull that CSS file again and everything will be synced up. So what I do in this uh, replace is I look in index.html and I look for any, this is just some regular expression ugliness, foo equals and then any number and then I'll replace it with a foo equals and then just a random number and I'll pipe it back out to uh, public. So now when I go like if we look at this right now, you'll see the CS number it ends in 62. So now let's try running that. We'll go to gulp replace. Oop. Plain spell. And it changed that. So remember it was ending in 62 and now it's ending in 67. So it just randomly replaced that number and that will keep our uh, bust our, the user's cache and we won't have stuff get out of sync. Now, those are really the big main tasks I run for scripts, styles, and uh, uh, cache busting, image optimization. Let me just pull in all these stuff from my regular grunt file. And you see we have a couple of other things here. One, we have Uglify. Remember, we don't want to load that every time when we're developing because it's slow in a separate thing. So we can run that uh, separately. And we have Live Reload set up. And live Reload is basically uh, um, uh, talking about this a lot before. When you it basically sets up a little web server on a socket, and your uh, web browser connects to it. And whenever there's a change on your files on the server, it can send the browser a message and reload that resource. So you can have your browser over here and your, your code window over here and change over here. And you don't have to hit anything over there. It refreshes for you. Saves a ton of time. We have live reload set up. And then you can set up kind of these meta tasks that are, that are running a bunch of other things. Like we have a dev task that starts live reload and it watches our less files and our JavaScript files. If our less files change, it runs that styles task. If our scripts, it runs the scripts task. HTML or images, it runs those tasks. You see at the end of all these now, after I write to the destination, I do a refresh of our uh, tiny LR server. So now I have a task for that for development. And then for build, it runs the styles the replace, the image min, and the uglify. So now, go up to gulp, and uh, we'll go dev, and it's going to start live reload, and it's ready to go. We'll go up to our browser, and we have live reload extension installed. We'll just click that there. So now, I'm gonna maneuver these around, if I go to this less file, and right now this hover color you see is kind of a yellow. 
if I change this and less this highlight color to just say blue, hit save, we go over here, see now they're blue. And if you look at your, your JavaScript console, what I'll tell you is this onloading and unpolling. CSS doesn't require a change or, or a whole browser refresh. If you change JavaScript or HTML, it will. So now I can change this back to you see that work change this back to the old color you see it does this polling now it's back to that color and you can start developing without doing the control tab refresh oh, didn't quite get it control F5 all, all day long that's just bad so we've got a golf task running for all of our development that handles our CSS and our JavaScript so if we were to make a change in JavaScript and I'm not going to change anything. I'm just going to hit save. See, it'll go and it'll refresh the whole browser for any of our JavaScript files. Put them all back together and we're good to go. And then, when we're done with our development, we'll control C out of there and we'll just go gulp build. And it's going to do our rerun our styles, it's going to uglify the JavaScript and compress our images. And now that site is ready to go deployed out to the server and uh, take your phone off the hook in case you did anything really bad. So that is a modern workflow with a task runner. And uh, I don't care what you pick. Pick Gulp, pick Grunt, pick uh, a GUI tool, pick a uh, guard. If you're doing web development, you really got to use a task runner. You see, it can save you. You set it up once for your project, it'll save you so much time, so much effort, and make your output product so much better. Because you have to do this stuff. I can't tell you how many times I, I come across code in production that this hasn't been done to. Uh, may I should just tell you why, why you do this stuff. For CSS uh, pre-processing and minification. You want to minimize, gen generally speaking, there are edge cases. Generally you want to minimize the number of requests a browser makes back to your server. You don't want a whole bunch of CSS files. You want them concatenated and you want to reduce bandwidth. You want them minified. And so you might say to yourself, well, I'm gzipping text content out the door. Minifying doesn't, uh, doesn't matter. It does. A minified uh, file that's gzipped is smaller than a non-minified file that's gzipped. Minifying makes a difference. For JavaScript, uh, you absolutely don't want to be, I don't want to see anywhere in your document 18 different script loads. That's terrible for performance. It's really, really bad. You need to put those together. You need to uglify it. And uglifying it just squashes the bejesus out of it and you end up with, uh, say, an 800 kilobyte file will end up being about 400 kilobytes and maybe about you know, 120 kilobytes after it's gzipped and heading out the door. Image optimization is probably the top thing everyone should just stop what they're doing and go do on their websites. You might save 30, 40, 50% of your page weight um, optimizing those images. If you just shuck it right out of uh, Inkscape or Photoshop or whatever. Bad, 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 bad. Uh, people agonize over including JavaScript libraries and this and that, and they should, but usually images on a lot of sites are what's killing them. Uh, but all this stuff is really important and stuff you should be doing all the time. And a task runner is the way to go. Before I wrap up, since we're looking at the quality of life dashboard on that, and I probably get more questions about that than anything, uh, it's moving along really well. You can see all this in the dev channel. It's got, uh, it's using this chosen thing so you can search. Uh, go right to your metrics. You can search the map and uh, geocode. Uh, I, nobody understands what a, a opacity slider does. So rather than that, when you zoom in to where you'd actually see stuff, I have it go semi-transparent. Uh, 
uh, so you can see features underneath it. And when you zoom back out to where you couldn't see stuff anyway, it goes fully opaque. No opacity slider needed uh, because no one knows what those do. It's got a time slider. That's all working. All the automation there is working. Uh, you'll see on the chart what you have selected will actually move around uh, based on the time. You'll see it kind of animates the... Uh, you can also have as many selected as you want. You see it animates when you hover over something. It'll put... Uh, you can't see me pointing at the screen. It'll, it'll put little circles there and then when you select it, it'll draw the line. And you'll see it on the charts. What's kind of cool is you could take like uh, anything you want. Uh, let's see, let's go back to income. And we'll go back to where it was real actual data, not my fake data. And select everything in this low bracket. And it will select all that stuff. And then you can go to a different metric. Uh, say, uh, dropout rate uh, for schools and it's going to move this stuff and if those neighborhoods move together in a block you can say well those things are kind of maybe correlated they might be related if they kind of fan back out you go well maybe not so much so you can see the relationship between variables uh, that's basically where that project is now you can get all that code out there on the uh, on the dev branch of the quality of life dashboard project Anyway, that's it. That's a task runner, uh, gulp, and running the basic kind of tasks you really have to be running as a web developer. So I hope you found that useful. And uh, I feel like I keep doing this, but sorry I haven't been posting much. It's been crazy here. But uh, I will try to post more. And enjoy your coding, and I'll catch you later.